beginning with the land and looking at it from different perspectives uh, of uh, traditional history, uh, place names, and language, and also archaeology. So I will uh, turn it over to Elaine Abraham to welcome all of you and to begin with her reading. This is what I really wanted to spend time on. 
uh, I'm going to let go a lot of what I was going to talk about because I want to cover history that has never been covered. They just think we're trying to go up and down the coast. In Yakutan, when we came from Copper River, we came down this area here. There's Bremner River and on to the mouth of Copper River. That's where the Okna is part of this whole group that ended up with four or five different languages before the Malaspina and others came to discover us. This area here is Kapu River. And when you see the Yakutat dancers at celebration, they have a different theme. That's because they started there in Chitna. And because when they left Chitna in a migration, what they brought down was their way of life that survives even today. So their, their, their clothes and their way of life is uh, Chitna. But it, it kind of got complicated. As they came here, they went out there, not to steal it, but to um, sing Korean songs. They went back and forth here, and uh, they eventually settled here in icy Bay. But the people we call the Yakabwantan, they're not like the Southeast Kabwantan. That Kabwantan part of their name is the Finkic influence as the Finkic world moved westward. So they, they got their name from a river right there. It's Katya. All these names are not Finkic, so you're not familiar with it. They're, they're all Gia. Uh, and in Yantica, the old people didn't call them Mia. That was not their name. The people in Yakita, the whole area that is now known as Yakita, the elders called the Mia, young form, people from here. So historically, it was not Kinkit, it was Mia, all the way down to Bridey, as you see some of the first things locally, we are fine to most. But this is the territory of the Yakutan And the ones that have survived there are whole remnants. We've got about 500 remnants that, that come out of this area all over the country. They're the descendants of um, Alan, the explorer, Lieutenant Alan's um, uh, friend, John Brenner from Scotland. And the way, even though the Eams didn't have the way of the drinking, their way of um, arranging marriages like they did in the Lincoln, uh country, that was an arranged marriage. When John Brenner, the Lake was exploring in this area, the man, the uh, Eams man thought, it would be a good idea to marry him off to his sister. So while he was exploring there, he found out he was married. So that's where all the descendants come from. His dad, and even though he was married, the son was captured. But uh, so this is where my mother grew up. All the elder brothers were born and raised in Bering River and Bering River Village is up here, way up here. And I've had such a wonderful time with John Johnson, who is who's two guests. And the two guests, um, Native Association, Corporation now own the land. So they have no history. So my mother, she's an Abraham Judith. And I think all that yeah, the things that have survived are my mother's fault. Uh, I was telling Steve last night as I was doing some of the names. And those are the names and the language I grew up in in Africa. Because my mother, all her sisters, all her aunts, all her brothers, all my brothers eventually ended up in the architect. But they were all born in the barrack 
so this book here. But because the dominant tribes were were printed, this book is only at home. Because they were beginning to learn printed and they were really being uh, sensitized into the uh, printed way of life. I was telling yesterday, I was telling, I was going through names with Steve, and it suddenly dawned on me all those names and all that conversation. It wasn't, it was me up, and I'll get into the back. <laughs> but um, this is the, what they call the Kadaka Gantan, and this is the area, their territory. Their wife, which is the Akna, that went down from Papa River, eventually moved over here to Icy Cave. They had their villages over here, and they owned all the way into, and those of you that have been in Yakutat to um, the end of the airport that faces the, um, the ocean. And if that was an interesting place, uh, that's where the, my mother's people completely owned and controlled. And then my father's people came where he started from just the other side of the Yakutat Airport to Lost River and then to Anklan. My father's branch is Anklan River. But it was interesting that that place at the end of Yakutat Airport was called a making land, both in Iyak and in Saint. That the the territory controlled part of it and the other part was controlled by the Inez or the Copper River people. But because they had but they had disagreements, that area became a place of peace. If you had an argument from something, somebody from your other clan, leaders sent you there. And then the negotiations started for a peaceful resolution for what, whatever the argument is. So that's, and the reason I had to go through this is our gift is in this area. The, um, the gift of the sea that Aaron, I like his name, is he calls it the gift of the glacier, which is the sea. That project is in this area right here. And that's in Ifpon, Copper River, or my people's territory. But the names are, bring out the mix of the people that were there. This area we call the Hayek, that's in Ea. But behind there, going towards uh, Hubbard Glacier, it's called a egg in Clinket. So the one part of it is here and the other part is uh, Clinket. So there was this merger of Clinket, Atna, Ia, and Sukhtia, the, the, the coastal Eskimo. And the coastal Eskimo raided uh, the Kayak Island constantly, and that's where a lot of the battles took place over territory. As I listened to the, to the men last night in their happiness, in their relationship, of what comes out from the deep history of what they were doing was they died for their land. All the land that we own, uh, my father used to say, uh, the blood still there. And those lands that we casually kind of uh, uh, give are, are, are deep secret, deep secret and sacred. And I have to move on here so we can really cover a little bit of that. This just gives you a little bit of the Iyak, Atna, 
uh, history of how they migrated. get the biggest kick out of those raw caves. But um Mimi would say how uh, food go in now it is time to start and the old man would say and he'd say, Well what am I gonna talk about to that big shower to the white woman? And Mimi would say, Yak yak that history shouldn't okay he and the place names. And the old man would say, Yak Khan Takki. That whole area, he'd say, Yak is here, Khan is the people, people of this land. That was the area, because there were all the place names all the way up to Dry Bay was, was printed on area. So the other ones that uh, very seldom heard from is the um, uh, Iyad Tishkwaiti, George Johnson and Jumbo. They were the last living um, um, uncle and nephew. But that's Yakal Duncan, and I just put uh, Edith Daly and Helen Bremner on there, uh, gave a lot of the history. But since my mother grew up, she did the, in that area, she did the Vashakkagwan history too. And in Yakutat, uh, we call the river southeast Kling, uh, Kagwan Khan outside Klinkets because they were not originated in Yakutat, that there, there's no original history. So, they start in Dry Bay, and Emma 
and Alice is uh, the one that gave those history. All these names here is the, uh, the uh, history of the Hubbard Glacier where we will be working and the Hayekatekat Bay Monkey Bay. These are the ones that are all uh, uh, born and raised in the Iyak language. And they were the ones that were the main uh, informants for the four volumes of a uh, Freddy's book. This one here we call them Kunachkunana, the real trinkets. Uh, they're the dry bay people, and, and we call them the real trinkets. But what brought them to, to my history, and I can talk about them, is because uh, the Tehkwede men married women of the Knafati as well as Kinef Kwan. So that Paul Henry here became a half-brother to, to my sisters. Go ahead. So that's the, the word, the um, sharing of knowledge. If it wasn't for these people, we would not know but know all of the gift that they gave to us. And um, these are names that are not clinked. These are the names that my mother and the family grew up in are saying that they didn't speak Iyak, they didn't talk about their land, they didn't talk about who they were because they were already absorbed into the Yakutat Klinkit. But it, this was a home language for me. And this is where my, my mother grew up. And this is the area she spent so much time in. It's Bukhaya, and that's, uh, and I might to get to if that God um, is clinking and here. God is island, and if that is a, is a place um, where there were a lot of fevers. My nephew, Donald Brenner's name is Ishtak called the man from from Ishtak, so you've got a Klinkit and Iyak together. And all of these names are, are are that way, but there's only those two that are Klinkit and Iyak. When we went through 268 names, of place names in the area, 61 were definitely uh, Iyak. And some Afna and some uh, Sukhbia. That's why this place is so interesting because of the multilingual. Uh, I'm not sure. I want to share this one with you. And I used to find my notes on that. Uh, I'll go with that notes. This is um, personal names from, from Yakutat. And. Um, my name, everyone, Southeast, everyone knows me by Chusha. Uh, Eric, uh, Steve found it for me. Everyone knows me as Chusha. And it was just taken for granted that it's printed, but it's not. My name, my professional name is Elaine Chusha Abraham. And that Chusha is really an Iyak name. In, um, in Iyak language, you in, in Trinket, we'll say, Shawata uh, the female grandmother. In Iyak, a mother's mother's name is Si Chu Shia. Si Chu Shia in, in Iyak. Like when you're saying, my grandmother is Susie. But when you're calling your grandmother, you'll say, Gram, Gram. My, my trinket, or what I thought was trinket, actually is to say Gram in, uh, in ear. And it's spelled Trusha. And the personal names that uh, Jeff Lear and I worked on last summer for my for honor ceremony. Turned out 
those inert plant trinkets. Sir, trinkets now. Their personal names are all here. Charlie Thomas is filled in, in uh, here. Yeah, it means man. Edith Ringer's name is uh, aged, and that means woman in here. So those Yakutak names are are in mingle of Sukhthia, uh, Atna, Klingtit, and Thea. And my, my um, Uncle Harry Bremner always told me that they had to learn different languages. So I just wanted to, and I'll go real fast from here on because Aaron has a 20 minute uh, video and Steve has run it. Beautiful. They are really beautiful, so I want to make sure you see that. When I looked at the harbor seals that we'll be working with in Yakutat, the abundance just floored me. Uh, go ahead. And in, uh, where we'll be working in Yakutat Bay towards Hubbard Glaciers, there are three glaciers. We used to just call them uh, one, two, and three glaciers, but they are actually have names. But before we even went up there, we went through a cleansing. Even today, they warn the hunters that they have to have at least a day of fasting and cleansing because that area has a strong spirit. The area behind, many of you are, are familiar in Hubbard Glacier. Going up to Hubbard Glacier, you hit the mouth of the Akatat Bay in Monte Bay, and that's La Chayek, which is also in here. And going back of it is uh, a egg. It just means behind, and it hits all these glaciers where the, where the seals are born and where they live, the ice flow seals. And that place is called um, a cake in, and that's Clinket Medea. But it was, I mean, um, disenchanted, disenchanted by Nalestin in 1791, because the, all the Spaniards were looking for a Northwest Passage. And by, by the queen that hired him, he was supposed to find it. And when he went there, it was covered with ice, and he was so disappointed he called it this enchantment bay. And I, I found records of him when I was in Madrid, but the interesting part of it is they were stationed in San Blas in 30 miles from Perle Vallarte, which is now the Wichal, Wichal Indians that I've been studying. But it's never a dull moment. Clinket Protocol says I cannot talk and Aaron and Steve cannot talk about a different clan. My father is Tequaybe and we'll be talking a lot about this lady because that was where her pictures are on Harriman's expedition. Her, and she is Tequaybe she is um, Anklan Branch of Tehwebi, and the uh, Shaki at the headdress she's wearing is the Duke. I think it's at the German Museum. And from here on, it's strictly protocol. Clinket protocol rules and regulations says you do not talk about a different uh, plan, even if it's your father. I learned that when I was really, really young. My father, they all shoot snuff. And about two doors away from my house was Mrs. Joseph Abraham, the Prahati Raven woman, married to my father's brother. And my father would give me a nickel and he'd say, go buy me snuff from my brother's wife. When I came back with the snuff, he paid me double that nickel. He paid me 10 cents 
for a very important podcast, not for the bad thing to strip protocol, even if it's your father, even if it's your mother. So the strict protocol says if I'm going to talk about KKB, I show you who they are. So this is Jenny Abraham. Next one. She's my aunt, or uh, uh, she is the sister of all of David Abraham, and she had a whole bunch of brothers. She was the only woman. There were all sound leaders, all of them. Half of those sons, he said, he might say the nine stances come from this man. They that kept quite the men that were strong in their traditions, and they were taught by their uncle, Ned Dr. Cleaning. And this is Jenny, and Erin will talk more about her, and I think uh, Steve will, well, too. This is Harriman's expedition. But as we talk, I will point to the seals. The seals' hair was tremendous, and it was invitation only. And uh, the brother-in-law, like when you were seeing the deep meaning of what was going on like, last night with the men, that relationship between um, marriage, between between owing each other, the invitations would go out at least two years ahead of time as to who would be hunted in the Hubbard Glacier area. And since she's there crazy, she's there because she, her grandfather, Yakuta Kay, was the raven ownership of uh, Yakuta Bay. Yes, his name Joseph Abraham on a lot of the pictures in, in Freddy's book and others, and but it's all of And their main uh, quest is the Duke, the Golden Eagle, and it's a long story. Beautiful story of the KKB from uh, Ankland that goes with that. And this, that was the last a uh, picture before it went to the museum. The other protocol I have to um, address is I'm also talking about my ancestors. My ancestors, if they were here, would give me the right to speak about my own ancestors. When my people, they were others, came from Chitna, halfway through, their guide was the Mount St. Elias. It's uh, the name is Ronsky Tisha, which is not thinking. But the spirits is what we deal with every day. And this is the spirit of the uh, Mount St. Elias, which is a very strong male spirit. Up until the coming of the American Yankees, there was this real strong relationship with the F or the shaman, with the spirit of Mount St. Elias. Mount St. Elias spirit controlled the north wind and the south wind. And the relationship was so deep that in, in a white man's language, we actually got sued for what Mount St. Elias did. There was a, a warrior from a, a, a sea hunter from a different clan and the architect used Mount St. Elias as a weather teller. If uh, certain parts of uh, Mount St. Elias they went, and the day before the man went to consult with Mount St. Elias, it was going to be a calm day. When he gets out there, those of you who are familiar with uh, first year hunting, they're way out at sea, and the only thing you can see is the head. Of Ron St. Elias, a storm came and he drowned. And his family sued my clan because of what Ron St. Elias, the spirit, said. Because he had control of the northwest and north wind and the south wind. We actually got sued and we had to pay for the man's life. 
That's our relation, spiritual relationship with the nature. I'm going to try to wind up just as fast as I can, but I wanted to welcome uh, my auntie. He's my granddaughter, Nirvana's brother, and she was so excited to see him dance last night. I was, I told them, to, according to Nirvana, no clinking male can dance like her dad and her brother. <laughs> She's an anchor of that you hear. But we transferred that, that those um, ancient beliefs of our Christian today to deed work. And that's what you see on the Mount St. Elias dancers when you see them. Again, you have, there's the spirit, the north wind, and the south wind. And his name is Paul. Oh, at my grandson, Guy. But when we were Atlas, now when we're looking at Mount St. Elias, we're talking about towards the end of a migration. Beginning of migration is the white uh, snowy owl. This is the spirit, their shaman spirits that they had when they were still in Chitna as Athabascans. This is their shaman spirit, the white owl. Because since we live down here, they always ask us, how can you have a snowy owl for an emblem? Well, maybe 3,000 years ago, we were those people, so I put it up there. You see, all over in Yakutat, we're the largest house group in Yakutat. You transfer it again to deep work, and that's cry again, and I put in a little bit of the spirit. We don't put the yake spirit or the shaman spirit into the, it's too strong. When we sing it on our potlatches in Yakutat, every young man and every young woman and baby here, ears and their eyes have to be covered because the spirits descend on the pot like the shaman's um, chant brings them in. So we're just hitting on, on protocols, how we deal with our relationship with our universe, how we deal with each other, the spiritual aspect of our life with our surroundings. Now we're back to seal, abundant seal at this enchantment day. I think, Steve, this is the one David shot. Steve and Aaron were up there with my, with my son last summer. Go ahead. And I just want to have a real fast. Uh, that's okay. The whole coastline is seal hunting place, all the way from Dry Bay, all the way up to... Uh, Kayak that they they uh, hunted seal year around, but the biggest seal hunt was always on the ice floes. So we covered all that area and we're covering. And as I looked at the seals of today and the um, uh, scarcity of uh, harbor seals, I can't help but wonder how they managed their resources maybe a thousand years ago or more. Uh, Aaron and Steve can get more into the archaeological sites that I'm so excited about that date back Yakutat seal camps to 900. But they thousands of seal, they're sexually active only after three or five years. They breed in July. They have one pup they have 10 months of, dis of uh, gestation. And yet, in 1964, uh, a white person from Seattle came to Yakutat to buy seal skins. From Mahapain hunters in June and July, he came out of there with, with 3,600 seal skins. How many seals were was that? when they only can breed after four or five years, they can only have one pup and their gestation is longer than a human being. 
how did they maintain that management to keep alive those resources? So, and when in 1980, um, my clan members, two of them, came out of there and from Icy Bay, one group had 600 seals and the other had 900 seals. And that's because, I don't remember which agency was, de was buying seal noses for $3 because they were blamed for destroying the salmon decline of salmon. So we were hunting thousands in one summer there. My question is how did we manage to do that when one seal can consume so much? So we're back to the seal hunters who just go buy them, uh, Steve and, and um, Aaron will cover more. And I wanted to bring it down the protocol uh, these are my my brothers from what we call the real clinkets from Dry Bay area. They're the Henry boys. They're related to me through the Tequidi men. They're Tequidi men married into the to the Taknahadi as well as the Nehqua. This is Nelly and Lena's brothers. And fat seals, if you just to taste them. They don't dress them when they kill them. They, they get four or five at a time and then the next one, then they go on shore to dress them. They have different kind of rifles for beach shooting and from ice floe shooting and for uh, moving boats. They have different kind of rifles. And you'll see this is Jerry Nelson, John Nelson here. The fat seals are being dressed, and all they do is pull the, the um, uh, long intestines. And this is Ishan, again, part to relationship with animals. Ishan means poor kid in Clinket. Um, English words are so inadequate that I just get so frustrated. In our way of life, Quiet to you, an animal has asked for their life. It very rarely happens, especially since seal is considered food. This is a four or five week pup, and the mother was killed. And as the mother was um, going down into the ocean, the baby, ba the baby seal that was already being weaned was on top of the mother, and she came up right in her last breath to the canoe. And so it was to ask for the life of the pup. So they brought it home, and that's because of Ishan. I had to feed it. There's Ishan very demanding for his food. And I kept it in a tub. So there he is. He went to a zoo. It's Ishan. And these are the old timers. Um, Steve will talk more about it. Want another one? And this, uh, and the reason I put this there is that's what we deal with. We deal with this uh, enormous icebergs. And you have to know exactly what the tide is doing, what the wind is doing, and where you can get your stick up past the eye flows so you don't get crushed by that size of glaciers. And, and this is George on what I, cur I call current seal hunters. We all tease him about that outward murder power. And the woman's roles, it's really a lot that I wanted to say about the women's role because it, it, their work was tremendous. But we'll go right to the, to the uh, byproducts. This is Minnie Johnson. She was the main informant for Freddie. She's my Suknachati, my coho aunt. And this is uh, Daisy Cranston, uh, Minnie Johnson's uh, granddaughter. There were two types of seal frames. 
what I call field, field um, seal frames. They're made out of sapling, and you just bend it. They did hundreds and thousands of those as you see in other slides. Main product, the seal fed us, they nurtured us. Thousands of moccasins went out. Thousands there all over the world. They washed good. But what else were they good for? They were good for ceremonial reasons. Uh, every potlatch has to have some kind of a seal meat and seal oil. And you have to have uh, dry fish. Uh, back to that one. Uh, this is Judy's dry fish. And um, everybody gathers around to see, and if she's not looking, you grab a piece and dip it in seal oil. <laughs> she's canning them. Judy is supposed to be here, but she's got school work. It's my daughter that's part of the team. She's doing her PhD work in Fairbanks. And again, this is ceremonial use. It's canned, it's given, and they would give it as um, cases and cases of giveaway at our potlatches. And this is Kanegwa, and see all your trinket sizes, and she, she has better get handkerchiefs for your saliva. <laughs> um, that first one is um, Kanegwa, is a uh, painted. Painted berries. They're shaft gray, gray, what's those berries called? Currants and blueberries mixed, and you put flour in it, and then you cook it, and then you pack it in seal oil, which is your preservative. Black seaweed in seal oil. A dunkazik is a ceremonial dish. Dunkers is, is what all clinkets do at their crying potlatch. Dunkers is, is fish to the fire. That's how we, we um, uh, feed our spirits. Those that have died, you do it at your 40 day potlatches and your payoff potlatches. The first part of the ceremony is Dunkers is. Well, because in the olden days we cremated our people. So you have to have fire dishes because the um, food went into the fire to reach the spirits, otherwise they wouldn't partake. And then we're coming to the end, and I love this. I, when I go home, I go to see the river, and this eagle, back to the person, this eagle was sitting there watching all the fishermen there. So. I went up and I said to, to him, Afsani has those of my father's people. Darcia is a I knew very well what he was doing there, but I asked him anyway, what are you doing here? And he wouldn't answer me. So, so I called him, oh, you handsome man. This uh, kinds of things was going on last night. And I said, oh, you handsome man. Da sayeta in there. Oh, you handsome man. Da sayeta in there. Ach, yet is friend. And I was interpreting a song that the New King dancers did to my niece, Carlet uh, Marino. Their Yakutat, the Pnachati, the Chanhas, they the great great grandchildren of Max, I tell you. It's the Marino girls. They're my, they're my uh, nieces. I was interpreting to her. It was a sad love song that they did, and I don't have the right to translate it for you, only they can. But these kinds of things that we look at at this time, conference. This is so deep, it would take us a year to analyze all of it. And he finally began to turn around very slowly to, and he chose this hole that was just clear and nothing growing on it to look. Actually, what he was doing was he was looking at the Sea River for fish 
and uh, he said he would fly from there to pick up the fish. But my relationship is my father's name is uh, a God King, Tepoidi name. It's an eagle that flew out to feed their young. That's what this eagle was doing. That's why I was talking to him. And in Trinket, they say, you see, basically, in Trinket, they'll say, do you know your, your grandparents? And maybe, do you know your grand district? So that's why I was talking to him. He finally turns around, and he sings. I swear he turned around and he sang for two seconds at us, just loud whistles. So then he rested the next one, and then he flew away, and I called him the flirting eagle. He flew to a little branch there so he could show off at us. So that's why flirting eagle dedicate this to all you eagle men out there. And I'm going to end with my niece, uh, Don Brimner's uh, daughter, who's been a rough time with me two years ago. I put them through eight days of fasting at a woman's coming into, coming out of the blanket, behind the blanket ceremony. She's in Vancouver. She puts this on her Facebook. She'll die that I'm sharing it. She says, my perfume is sea oil. I need sea oil to dab around me to attract eagle boys at the 2012 celebration. My name is Allison. Are you eagle boys? Find my grandma to my knees. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Elaine. Uh, it's really a privilege to be working with Elaine. Obviously, we learn uh, so much in the course of doing this, and that was a wonderful uh, presentation. What I'll be doing is um, just giving you a little bit more background on our project uh, and looking at some of the historical and archaeological dimensions of it. Uh, I'm Aaron Kroll. I'm the Alaska Director for the Smithsonian Arctic Studies Center and uh, the principal, principal investigator for this uh, project, the Akitatsio and Temps Project which is sponsored by the National Science Foundation. <coughs> and uh, uh, our research focuses on this relationship that we've just heard about, um, but looking at it historically, this relationship with the seals that goes back 900 years, um, and uh, the relationship between the seals, the people, the glaciers that flow into Yakutat Bay, uh, and how this history has been recorded in oral tradition and place names and in archaeology. Uh, and I'll, I will give a brief overview, and then we have a, a really nice uh, uh, video that uh, was filmed last summer that uh, during our meetings with elders uh, in Yakutat and on visits to some of the old sealing camps. Now, um, Yakutat Bay, just a little bit of geography, is this 35-mile-long fjord in southeast Alaska. And on the north side, it has the two massive glaciers, the Malaspina and the Hubbard. Um, and this is a, an ecologically exceptionally rich location, in particular because of the thousands of harbor seals that give birth to their uh, pups on the ice flows in front of Hubbard Glacier. And the ice pack provides protection uh, from killer whales, uh, and the seals and their young can stay, stay uh, safely on top of the ice uh, no matter what the tidal conditions are uh, uh, and the predators are around it protects them. And then throughout history, and, and of course today, the people of Yakutat have hunted the seals on the ice floes during the spring after the seals are independent of their mothers. Now if we go back 900 years uh, to the end of the neoglacial period, this shows Hubbard and Malaspina glaciers just blended into one. At that time, 
they were much larger and filled up the whole bay. And then as the temperatures warmed, uh, the ice withdrew, and the seals came to the bay, and the people also migrated there. And as Elaine was saying, Yakutat became a crossroads where cultures and languages blended. And according to oral tradition, the Iyak and Sukyak uh, were the first to come from the Copper River and Prince William Sound areas. Then the Atna immigrants from the Chitna River arrived. And finally, about 250 years ago, the Clinket clans that moved up north, uh, moved to the north from Cross Sound and Icy Strait. And this was at the peak of the Little Ice Age when the cold and when cold temperatures, re temperatures returned. In many other places where seals were um, you know, predominant in fjords filled up with ice. For example, at that time, Glacier Bay uh, was completely filled with ice. And uh, we think that Yakutat Bay, because it wasn't filled, because it was actually opening at that time, may have become a place where both people and seals gathered uh, in large numbers. Now, the dots on here are archaeological sites, so some of them are labeled with some radiocarbon dates. Um, and one of the really interesting things about Yakutat is as the ice gradually withdrew, of course, people made new camps near the edge of the ice for the hunting. And this, the archaeological sites that are out at the mouth of the bay are older. And as the ice withdrew, um, they become younger and younger, uh, going up into the bay. So this shows the present uh, period of the glacier, the present location of the glacier. And it's the oral traditions about these old camps, um, their descriptive names in several languages, sometimes even combinations of uh, languages in the names, uh, and the archaeology of these camps that are helping us to really put uh, an interesting story that goes back over the last 900 to 1,000 years and put that all together. So the big questions of our research uh, working together are how have the glaciers and environment changed over time? Um, what are the locations and dates of these old sealing camps? What are the indigenous language names uh, for the camps of all ages, and what do those names mean? And uh, we're looking at the oral traditions, the cultural values, social practices, and beliefs associated with sealing, looking at the seal hunting methods and techniques, and how did people live in the camps, and how was social life organized? Elaine was talking about the interrelationship between the clans and negotiations for hunting rights. That's all part of it. And the long-term relationship between people and seals, looking at Yakutat Bay as this really complex ecosystem in which um, people were a part. Now, we do know, as I mentioned, that the oldest sites are out at the bay mouth. Um, and the, the, uh, the Lost River sites down here are occupied, were occupied at a time when it was ice-free, very early on, dates back to around 784 AD. There's a couple sites out there at the mouth on the other side that were right at the glacial limit at the time it was occupied, and these may have been camps for the very first EF immigrants that arrived. Um, there is the Old Town site where Frederica de Laguna did, actually did archaeological excavations, occupied around 1550 AD. And then uh, Kakata, which is, uh, was still there in 1791. Malaspina actually visited that camp in 1791. And then finally, we see the late 19th century camps that were north of Point Latouche. And uh, this is where the Harriman expedition visited in 1899. And this is uh, where our work was concentrated the past summer, at this very camp. And Edward Curtis was the photographer for the expedition I'll go back a second. Uh, he took a series of really interesting and important photographs. On this one, you can see the sealing canoes pulled up in front of the tents where the families were staying during the, the sealing season. When we looked at this beach that stretches all the way from Indian Camp Creek to Acadolce Creek, the, the English uh, and Spanish names, um, we found canoe paths all along that entire one kilometer long beach. And it really emphasizes that uh, these hundreds of paths represent a very large scale usage of this very large group that was gathered there uh, during the seal hunting season. It was really exciting to find those. Now, here's another, another Curtis photograph. Uh, it's a section of the same camp. Um, we can see the seal skins on the stretchers, the, the dwelling tents, uh, the canoes up on the beach. And it's easy to imagine how this living context of 1899 could be transformed 
into an archaeological site over time. What, what do people leave behind? So buried in the ground, we might expect to find the remains and outlines of the shelters, uh, different kinds of artifacts, charcoal from fires, and scattered seal bones. Now, interesting, if you look over in the far right, um, you can see a, um, a woman who is scraping a seal hive and perhaps leaving a tool or some other trace behind that would mark this activity. Well, we know that Curtis uh, kind of walked down the beach and took this photograph then of Jenny Abraham, um, Elaine uh, Abraham's father's sister, and she's using a knife to separate the seal blubber from the skin. And the women and families lived and worked at this type of camp called a family camp, while the men used smaller camps that were closer to the glacier during hunting, and then they brought the seals back, as you saw, the fat seals in the canoe. And some of the old-time artifacts, these are actually from old town site, include these barbed sealing harpoons before rifles, which is what people were using. And then these are stone tool versions of the same type of knife that Jenny Abraham would have been using for cleansing of the seals. And this past summer, we were actually at, so you can see that same picture down at the bottom from the Harriman expedition. If you line up the ridges, you can tell that we were standing pretty much where that tent was. Um, and this was our idea. It was really ex interesting and exciting to have this photographic documentation and then to find these remains of the camp in the ground. Now, one of the things that's happened is that um, there was an earthquake that happened just a few months after the Harriman expedition was there. It uplifted the shoreline. So we found the remains of that camp up on this terrace, as you can see, and it's really densely choked with alders and um, devil's club, not an easy place to work. But this is what that very place where we're looking at, we have these Curtis photographs, this is what it looks like today. Now, we, this is a map of it. Now you can see the beach and this channel and then the terrace uh, where the site is sitting. This is the area that we investigated, did a little bit of archaeology, uh, did some excavations, um, some test excavations and mapping. Uh, we found nails and rifle cartridges. All these little red dots are artifacts that were lying around. A wonderful cluster of uh, glass beads. It's interesting that there was a lot of bead worn or bead working at seal camp, apparently. Um, various metal artifacts and more beads. And then uh, this um, actual outline down there in the lower right-hand corner, we think is an outline of rocks that were around the base of one of the tents. Maybe the very tent that was in the photograph. We can't know for sure. It is exciting to find the remains of the camp. We think the camp is largely preserved, and it will be really interesting to do additional work there in the future. These are some of the artifacts uh, from the site. Um, and it's interesting, you can date these shotgun and rifle shells. They date to exactly the right time, uh, the 1890s and early 1900s. It does suggest that people came back to this site even after the earthquake. These are some of the beads, and then uh, if there was a tent, I think we even found one of the grommets from the tent right there. Um, our, our interest and uh, you know work on the project is about uh, bringing the, uh, the oral traditions and knowledge of sealing uh, together with this uh, enlarging the picture of the environmental change that's happened, um, looking at the physical evidence uh, of archaeology, and even um, maybe taking some of those old names, and since they apply to particular archaeological sites, and those sites have known ages, we, we may even be able to tell how old some of those names are by that indirect method. So we're interested in doing something that's very interdisciplinary, very collaborative uh, with the community of Yakutat, and we are uh, working together, I think, in a really uh, productive way. And this is, this is George Ramos and Judy Ramos uh, just uh, at our, our camp last summer. Um, I want to say when I teach to all of the people who have helped us with the project, I want to um, lead into a film now, which that we kind of set the context. And this will uh, show a little bit of our work from last summer. Um, that will lead in then to um, uh, Steve Langdon's uh, presentation uh, following that. So let me bring up that film.
<laughs> yes, um, they are the ones that were shown there. Was interesting. They were like 32 caliber. Uh, some of them, I don't remember the exact calibers off the top of my head, but they're much larger than the weapons that people use today. And you'll see it. There's a little bit of discussion about that in the film. Today they use uh, 22s, basically because of the low sound. Okay, well let's try this. So I lost my sound. Sorry about that. We got this all set up with uh, our tech guys. Yeah, that's true. Uh, we can take, take questions. Um, we lost our sound. Если кто-то тут отдыхает и ищет, не мелохает. А. А тенька кайлюта высоко я увы от списа хитту саяхтка. А я вапат я сатан. А я я я те Take a son and you have to teach a way I ain't a teacher. The first, the very first times I can remember going up, uh, was going up with my mother and father and uh, some other people, and we went up in canoes, of course, and, you know, and playing canoes that they used to build. And, and I was very, very, very young then, because I remember when we were going through the, or past the uh, glacier, they always used to make us lay in the bottom of the boat and be very quiet. And when I asked my mother why we had to do that, she said, we don't want to make noise because we don't want to disturb the spirit of the glacier. And then we'd go up and to seal camp, 
sometimes real close and point to two, sometimes we go up behind uh, Dago Island. Mm -hmm. April was restricted. April, no one can go up there to hunt seal because that was the pupping time. And Hubbard Glacier would completely close in. Uh, the ice would just get packed so you can't get in there until the babies were born and the pups can swim. And then it opened up and then they could go. They could go uh, hunting. What we are waiting for is this ice pack that's out here to start breaking open. They call it breaking open. Oh, and could get part of this. And could get part of this. I was not taking the market for a moment. That's what it is when you translate it and then you're hoping that it'll open up on the snail sitting on the ice. You can see the current pushing mm -hmm. on that ice and breaking it open. And uh, you hope that it will open it. And there's a lot of times we see them sitting on the ice like that. And if it should break into a herd, and they're not aware of you coming down through there, you look at them. Mm -hmm. One seal will keep his head up. And he'll watch. And the rest of them sleep. There's a trick we used to to use and one is we'd watch the seals, like when there was a bunch of on ice. We'd watch them. And then all of a sudden you'd pick up the watchman. And they take turns. One will be up and the rest will be napping. And that one will put it down and another head will come up. So we used to watch that, and when the watchman's head came up, we'd shoot the watchman. The watchman? Mm -hmm. You shoot him with a magnum. It doesn't make much noise. And uh, that noise of the uh, little caliber is just about the same as the noise that a glacier makes when a small chunk of ice falls from high and hits the water. Mm -hmm. And it carries that. It's just like a rifle shot. Mm -hmm. I got it. I got it. <laughs> When they're hunting seal on the ice, they stay flat in their canoe. You remember, you don't, you don't have a rifle to, to uh, shoot a seal with. You have to come as close as possible because you harpoon it. Mm -hmm. So the men, there would be two men to a canoe. One would be in the back to, to steer the canoe to where the ice packs is. And the one in front that has the jihanet or the harpoon next to him. And he wore these long gloves as paddles. Mm -hmm. 
and they would sneak up to the ice flow uh, using their, their hands as paddles with the second man steering it. You would come so close to the edge of the ice, the hunter can decide which seal he's going to harpoon. And your clubs are made out of seal cup. Our intestines, the woman would show them this kind of what. And you lay down like that on the top of it and you push the ice away mm -hmm. from the front. And you just work your way through the ice just like that. Mm -hmm. You can pass the ice there, is to say. This one here is a wide. That means all this area going back and down. This one's a narrow. So that Shona Kusa. The main camp was down here. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they used to come up here when they go hunting and come back down. Our grandfathers, our uncle on our mother's side, I thank you. We are coming to you. we have come to your country where you used to hunt. And you brought me here when I was a little boy. And you as you used to put the food into the fire and call your grandfather. And we ask you to be with us. Don't let trouble come among us. And don't let anyone get hurt in this country, for we give you the tobacco. Oh, <laughs> 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 This was all dry when I put this in. <laughs>
Uh, we're at the first SEAL camp north of Point Latouche, and we are just uh, inland from the beach, 100 meters or so, and we have been looking for evidence of the old camps. What they picked up with the metal detector was this uh, rifle cartridge. Uh, it is a, uh, an old one. I, I think I recognize this type from previous work at Glacier Bay from the late 19th century, early 20th century uh, camps there, Clinket camps along Icy Strait. Also, this enigmatic uh, piece of iron, uh, like a little cup with a stem on it, uh, we'll, haven't identified this, but it's iron, it's well rusted, and this would also be consistent with something that's been in the ground for 100 years or more. So the history of this area is really amazing as the glacier was receded. The end of the glacier was 30 miles out in the Yakata. As it was melting back, the hunters were moving up along through there. So this valley appeared and at the time, Malaspina came up here, there was a hunting village right along this ridge. My father's name was Eikat um, Kain. It means the eagle that, that flew out for food to feed its young. And he had four brothers. There was Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac Abraham, Martin Abraham, Joseph Abraham, and another um, Yaakov. And they had one sister, Jenny. Mm -hmm. Jenny Abraham, that the Heronings expedition took a picture of her up at the sealing camp, and she was fleshing seal. That place is the, the place where there is abundance of seal. Mm -hmm. And seal is the major food source of all Clinket people. But seal was basic food for us, you know, like my mom would smoke it and stuff and dry it, you know, cook it, mm -hmm. and then put them in it. Remember those, uh, Big round, hard cans there, about that big round of and I. Mm -hmm. She put the finished seal meat in there, and then when it was full of meat, then she pour the oil in there and cover it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they even have like four or five of those, mm -hmm. and that would last us pretty much through the winter. Well, if you're out hunting and you get cold, uh, we always take seal oil and dry fish along, and you can pull into a shelter out of the wind and we stop and eat seal oil and then the dry fish and within an hour you're nice and warm again. Yeah. Yeah. My grandma used to put the flippers up in the sea line. Yeah. And uh, the shoulders and the ribs and the liver and the heart. Those are my favorites. <laughs> Just forgive us for taking your life or your breath. It's a circle. We are hungry.
Now I know we're we're running long, but um, Steve Langdon is giving his presentation next to wrap this up. We're just at five of noon now, so. Okay. Oh, you, oh, you want to say quick words? to the Kiksadi and recognize uh, the Sitka tribe and uh, thank them for hosting this plan and allowing us to uh, put on this presentation. It's been my uh, great honor and privilege to be able to work with uh, and uh, George Ramis and their daughter, with the daughter uh, Judy. I just want to briefly say that uh, um, that Judy is um, going to be is funded to receive her doctoral um, dissertation research uh, through this project, uh, supported by uh, NSF, and uh, she's going to be working on these, some of these questions that we raised earlier that have to do with uh, specifically the issues around uh, the long-term management of the seal population, the cultural practices that were associated to ensure. Uh, the sustainability uh, of those animals. So we're really uh, delighted to have this opportunity to have such uh, significant interdisciplinary opportunities and to have Katie's um, work uh, uh, go forward. Uh, Elaine talked to, uh, I, I want to say a little bit about the project origin and, and then uh, uh, touch on some other uh, materials associated with the video I'm going to show. Project Origins arose from uh, conversations that uh, George Ramos and I had uh, uh, in the summer of 2010. Uh, I was in the ACCAD on another project, and he was, uh, uh, we were talking about some of the ancestral arrival, and uh, uh, he said that the story said that they, when they arrived, that the glaciers were at the mouth of, uh, uh, of the bay, and, uh, and that uh, Subsequently, as the bay retreated, uh, he had been taught that there were the names of na nine seal camps in that cafe that uh, were used at the time. Well, this provoked in my mind uh, the connection, the connection uh, that allowed us to think about, well, not only were the place names there, but the location. So the question arose, uh, could we find those camps? And this is what uh, brought me and Aaron together. Uh, to move the, forward, the, the uh, project forward and to be able to see if we can find all the seal camps. And this is how the project is going to be going forward over the next three years. Uh, three years of additional funding came along. Uh, so that's, a, that's how this came from. It's a very clear interdisciplinary and, and its foundations are in the old tradition. So that's very important to, uh, to emphasize. Um, uh, Elaine uh, has talked a little bit about the linguistics, and that's one of the central things that we'll be working on. And the other central thing that uh, is the uh, uh, fleshing out of all of the cultural activities, other activities that are coming forward. And so I wanted to turn, and I will turn now to talk uh, to show some of the videos. There are three additional videos here that I'm going to uh, uh, turn to, and uh, we'll look at. These uh, were additional opportunities. Not only did Clinkets engage in sealing at Cat Clinkets, but they also had a number of other uh, appropriate uh, activities that fleshed out and filled in what it is that's going on. Uh, one of the things that uh, this time of year is also the time to be up there, is a left or right hand one, is that this is also the time when seagulls uh, are um, uh, uh, having their eggs. Another 
My uncle got mad at me and said, you should have been up there picking eggs because they're going to leave in a few days. I was goofing off and I walked out. <laughs> but you, you pick a certain time. When you first come up here, their eggs are one. Most of them are one egg in each one. And those are the good ones. First one you pick. And then later on about an egg, there's two eggs in there. But when there's three eggs in there, you don't pick them, none of them. Because when three eggs, the last one is born with a chick inside already. It's a bad egg. <laughs> I want you to take a picture of me first talking to you, and then you can switch down to the fire. And there's a water waterfall around the point where I had to go and get water. And I used to run around. When I first come up here, I used to find flat rocks for the old timers to use as a dish. And uh, when the seal meat is cooked, each guy pokes in there. What they do is they, they cut the ribs in there, the fat in there, kidneys, part of the stomach, liver, and put it all and boil it in one pot. Whatever you cook, that's what you eat. <laughs> Only that of it. I thought it was funny first time until I got used to it. Now you poke one. Do it like I just cut it up. They used to pull their seals up here and they bait hunt. I put them right all through here, like that. And then after you get through eating, then you have to go down there and, and clean them. And uh, <clears throat> pull a canvas over the top of it, actually put ice in. That's really nice like that. And usually the head, uh, they take one and cut it up and start cooking it. <clears throat> Maybe next day they finish it. Because the guy sometimes from the other place would come over and visit. He'd stay here about better than two weeks. When he, uh, uh, he was told by his uncle uh, as a young man to go get all those flat rocks and then he go go went and was told to go and give a formal invitation to the other sealers who were in the area who all came there together and they had a feast right there. The, I was the uh, uh, cameraman out in that skiff when we uh, when David shot the uh, seal and uh, during that particular activity I learned that uh, uh, tr traditionally there were some other significant activities that had to be conducted um, that led to some of you may be aware of you watched it there are a lot of um, hand signals that are used in association with other body movements for communication by uh, in various different contexts. Uh, and so this uh, video uh, gives a particularly interesting um, discussion around what had to be done in the ceiling here, uh, when there were ceilings.
when you're communicating with your hands, yeah. to think it's to have a term for that action. Keep the call. Okay, there you go. That's what you. Yeah. And that means talking with my hands or what? That's <laughs> right. Just keep the call. Means you translate what the animal's doing. Yeah. Very good. Excellent. It's like you're imitating me. Mm -hmm. you know, you're imitating a bear. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the original hunters, I call them, the old timer, they never talked much once they started hunting. You never uh, turned around, you never moved very fast with your head. We are slow, slower than panning with a camera. But they had signs for different animal, individual. And it was really something to see. Because the two men, <clears throat> the person who is the hunter is the one that sits in front. And the person in the back is the man who moves the boat. And sometimes they'll see a seal on the ice. And you try to get that tension of the man who's going to shoot from the front without making any noise without talking or anything. What you do is you grab the side of the canoe and you shake it like that. And so let the guy in front know that you see something. <clears throat> and he in turn will look he look left and he look right. And up if you're close to the beat. And if he does not see anything, only then will he turn his head very slow and look back at you so they can just see you. And you in the back, you were going to go down like that. That means there's a seal on ice laying there. Yeah, there's this. Or sometimes he would be a kawayuk. That's what you call it when you shake the boat. You just, just one like that. And right away he knows there's something. He starts looking. And if he doesn't say anything, well then, he look back at you and you have to show him, you know. A bear has a tendency to swing his head back and forth when he's walking around the beach. His head falls to one side, he walks to that side, up on the other side here. That's what they're, they're always used to say. <clears throat> but if you're hunting in a mountainous area and you see something and you let him know that you see something and when he looks around because he didn't see anything, they come. mountain group walking up the side of the mountain. And then they have, uh, when you're going along, if he sees something on the beach, he 
I let him know he was back there. And when he doesn't see anything, he looked back at you and you tell him. Is a deer walking on a deep or is he moose? Well, see the answer, I said, here's who you are. <laughs> but the one that, the one that I thought was him is the uh, <clears throat> shape of the boat and he looked you know, can't see it down from and so he's home. Wolf. Mm -hmm. The one that I thought was the uh, real funny there, you said, hey. <coughs> Since you didn't see anything, and he looks back at you and you tell him. Wolverine. <laughs> yeah, and you see this Wolverine in this area. Oh, here, here, run. Let's stop, run. Uh, let's stand up. Run, run, run. run. Yeah. So, all of this island is uh, there. <clears throat> you know, and you have, uh, You have four or five seals sitting on the ice, you know. <laughs> Silent talking. And then the rest of it you can make up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I explained it to him now. They're ready for those hand gestures. The ones. Yeah. At the door, just give him a hand. Well, it's been my uh, a pleasure and honor to be able to work with George and Elaine and all of the other Yakutat people. And we look forward to doing uh, more of this research. I also want to thank you, Bernal Chish, and all of you for coming and listening to us. It's your lunchtime now, so uh, thank you again. We are, we'll talk to you again.